Well, we're super excited to sit down today with uh, pro referee Chris Penso. Chris, thank you so much for your time and sitting down with us. We're excited about this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So let me brag about you a little bit. This this comes from the interwebs, so you have it has to be true. Um, so you were so you made your debut in 2011, uh, New York Red Bulls and San Jose Earthquakes. Many yep. more. Uh, FIFA panel referee from 2013 to 2015, and now you're back on the FIFA panel as a VAR or VMO uh, since 2021. And then just some some notable uh, things along the way, MLS Cup playoffs, U.S. Open Cup finals, fourth official in 2015, MLS Cup fourth official in 2015, MLS All-Star Game in 2016, and then some really cool opportunities as a VAR in the last couple of years, working CONCACAF Nations League match, CONCACAF Gold Cup, the Olympics, uh, yeah. that was incredible, um, the MLS Cup, and then the uh, CONCACAF Men's U-20 Championships. So uh, lots of really neat opportunities along along your uh, journey for sure. Um, so let's start out with just kind of give us a little introduction about yourself, whatever you're willing to share. We'd love to hear about who you are, Chris. Uh, sure. So Chris Penso, um, uh, born 1982 in Dover, Ohio, which is a tiny little town of about 10,000 people. Um, now married to, um, I think everybody knows the better referee in the house, uh, Tori Penso. That question I think is coming up later. Um, been married to her since, uh, 2012. It's our 10 year anniversary this year, later this year in November, um, we've got three girls, Piper's eight, Joby six, Brinley is four, and we live in St. Petersburg, Florida. So that's the, that's the real skinny Cliff's Notes version of, uh, of, of the personal side, um, refereed soccer since 1997. Um, it's funny how I got into it. My club coach, when I was playing, you would have been you 14. Yeah. Um, I said, does anybody want to take a referee course? And I said, sure. Uh, so there was a group of us that went and took it up in uh, in Canton, Ohio, which is about 20 minutes up the road. Did a couple of weekends, got my badge, started doing kids games, and then uh, it just took off from there. Mm. Um, you know, I met, Tori and I met at a soccer tournament, so that's how I met my wife. Um, I've made a lot of friends along the way. Uh, left full-time employment to pursue full-time refereeing, so we can dive into that a little bit later, but... That's the skinny on on who I am and where I came from and what I'm doing. Yeah, there you go. And we'll we will dig into some of that other stuff that you're doing now as well. Um, but uh, you already mentioned about how you got into refereeing. Is there any more you want to add to as far as that first process and and those early years and then your journey along the way? Sure. No, it's um, it's been a fun journey. I started in '97, um, and you know probably. A lot of how a lot of stories start right kids you know play the game we, we play the game and then at some point along the lines you want to uh become more involved in it so i picked up refereeing you know back then it was um it was really just for for me to make make money on the weekends you know so i was doing u, u8 u10 games on the weekends and then started doing u14 games and started going to tournaments and 2000 i upgraded to grade seven which uh, if anybody remembers the grade structure back in the day, you started at grade eight, you worked your way um, up. So the lower your number, the better you were, uh, or in theory, I guess, right? Um, so in 2000, um, upgraded to grade seven, started doing more amateur games, went to youth regionals for the first time, um, did the youth regional circuit for five, six years. I went to nationals in 2002, uh, which is the same year I upgraded to state referee, grade six. Um a year later, I upgraded to state uh, grade five. And then through all that, I obviously um, finished college in 2004. I have a master, I have a uh, bachelor's degree in accounting. Don't tell John. Um, <laughs> I don't do anything with it. I don't even do my own taxes, but I do a bachelor's degree in accounting. Um, upon graduation, I, uh, I entered the Ohio State Highway Patrol uh, Academy became a trooper in 2006, did that for about two years. Um, and in the span of those two years, I refereed about three games. Um, and it was kind of driving me crazy. I, I missed it a lot. So I just walked into my lieutenant's office one night after shift and I said, I need to go do refereeing. Mm -hmm. I need to go, I need to go pursue that because that's a young man's dream. And you know, law enforcement's always going to be here if that's what I end up doing or coming back to. So I walked out and uh, got my national badge a year later um 2008 
And then the second year being a national uh, referee, 2009, I got invited to MLS. So I got that invite at the end of 2008. I got invited to 2009 preseason camp. Um, 2009, 2010, I spent two full seasons being fourth official in MLS. Um, met Tori in 2009 at Youth Regionals. Uh, I was there as a mentor in Region 3. And then uh, it just kind of kept going. It kind of kept moving my way up the ranks. As you said earlier, I, I debuted as a referee in 2011 at Red Bull Arena. Um, and here we are some, what, 11 years later, um, 209 regular season games or something like that, uh, which is crazy to think about. It's been that long. Um, you know, 14th year in the league and uh, cruising right along, you know, wore the wore the FIFA badge uh, 2013 through 15 and then um, got put on the VAR list at the start of 21. And then, um, you know, the last couple of years have just been crazy busy, crazy hectic. A lot of good things are happening. Um, like you said, I went to the Olympics, which was uh, quite a surprise, to be honest. Um, you know, and that whole you know there's a whole story there and I, i'll hit on it in one of the questions later but um i was out in 2020 um i had an achilles repair it was just a nagging achilles injury that's been bothering me for probably the better part of five or six years um so every off season i'd end up in physical therapy trying to rehab my achilles and every season um my window of comfort coming into the start of a season was getting shorter and shorter so when COVID hit um, in March of 20, about two weeks into the shutdown, uh, I suffered my third partial tear of my Achilles. Um, and a good friend of mine who I used to referee with, uh, he um, lives up in South Carolina, Dr. Ben Jackson. Uh, he and I always stayed in pretty close touch. We're good friends. I sent him my MRI and uh, he sent me a message and said, we need to have a telemedicine visit. And I said, that sounds serious. And he goes, yeah, let's talk about a few things. So um, we got on the horn, we had a Zoom call, and he said, it's time, it's time to open you up and uh, and clean this up once and for all. So I had the Achilles repair uh, in May of 2020, and then uh, nine months to the day, um, February of 21, I passed my fitness test and got back on the field. But uh, all through that rehab, uh, that afforded me the ability to spend a lot of time in the, in the VOR, um, as a VAR. So I got a lot of experience and a lot of work there and did well. Uh, and that ended up probably being the reason I got put on the VMO list for, for 21. Um, and then uh, I think the set of one or two days after opening weekend in 21, uh, I get a call from uh, Ishmael Elfath. And he goes, did you get the email? Like, no, what email? He goes, about Tokyo. I'm like, what about Tokyo? No, I don't have an email. He goes, you didn't get an email about the Olympics. And I go, uh, no, I would know if I have an email about the Olympics. Yeah. He goes, he goes, let me, hold on, let me figure out what's going on. So he calls me back a little bit later. And apparently um, the email, uh, they had an incorrect email address for me when they sent the invite. <laughs> um, so I finally get the email the next day. And I had like, I had like one day uh, to get the paperwork turned around and submitted uh, to FIFA for it's obviously accepting the appointment, but um, it really come full circle, right? You know, I, you know, when I came off the referee list in 2015, it kind of, you know, dashed the hopes and dreams of going to international tournaments uh, representing the country. Uh, but then that, you know, I got that call from Ishmael um, after I'd been out for a year and it was kind of bittersweet. And, you know, I never for once dreamed that I'd be going to Tokyo for the Olympics, but that's the journey. Uh, it's been, it's been a wild ride. I'm sure there's more chapters to be written in the book. Um, but so far it's, it's been a really rewarding, fun, memorable, uh, ride for sure. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if we want to go there now, but I will just touch on more of the collegiate side of things and what you're doing on the college side. I don't know if there's a reader's digest version of that, because that's fascinating to me. Sure. Um, you know, I mean, so pro pro came up, pro came along in 20 at towards the end of 2012, right? Um, so up until that time, we were all independent contractors, just working as many games as you could get under your belt because uh, your paycheck was a game fee. Um, so I spent a lot of my time, probably 2000, 2007 through 2011, even probably a little bit of 12, working as many college games as I get my hands on. And 
Um, 2010, I went to my first Final Four uh, out in Santa Barbara, California. I ended up going to uh, five more Division One Final Fours, so six total. Uh, one Division Two Final Four. Uh, I've refereed the national championship twice uh, for D1 men. Um, so that career has been has been great. You know, I remember way back. I remember there was a season I'd refereed like 62 college games, mm-hmm. and I don't know how I would possibly ever do that now. Um, like my body, like my body can barely take two games a week when that happens. Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I, uh, that was a, that was a really fun time. I've transitioned. I don't actively referee in college, uh, anymore, really. I, uh, back at, uh, actually in 2020 during COVID, um, I became the coordinator of officials for the American. So the AAC, the American athletic conference, uh, we have, uh, 10 men's programs and nine women's programs this season. That'll change a little bit next year with some more conference realignment. Uh, but it's been a really, uh, it's been a fun ride. You know, I don't think anybody probably expected me to become a coordinator of officials, um, in my thirties, uh, cause it's, you know, but at the same time, I don't really have, uh, the freedom or the flexibility or even the time to referee college anymore, not to mention my body. I don't think could take it and we're prohibited, um, under the C- under the collective bargaining agreement anyway. We can't referee college until we're released for this at the end of the season. And that doesn't usually come until sometime in November. So it's all kind of a wash. So I wanted to transition. I, I love college soccer. It's been great to me. Um, but I wanted to transition into a role where I could have impact. Um, and anybody who works for me knows uh, I dedicate a lot of time and resource to education. Um, you know, I have I was actually working today. I've got some clips. We have a, a webinar tomorrow night. I try to have biweekly webinars during the season. We have a video quiz in advance, and then we have a pile of discussion clips. Each webinar is about an hour and a half, and um, it's I think it's refreshing for a lot of college officials because it's it's you know year over year over year it's not something we've been accustomed to to having. Right, we just go out and we do games and you know destroy your bodies, and then by the time November rolls around, you can't walk anymore. Um, and there's no you know there's historically not been any you know, digesting of games and clip analysis and learning. You just, it's on from one game to the next, to the next, to the next, right? So uh, I'm trying to bring a, a refreshing new approach to collegiate officiating. I think it's been pretty well received. I love what I'm doing. I'm getting great feedback on it. Uh, and I'll continue to do it as long as you know, my schedule allows. So would you almost describe this as a new era of college of Hey, hey, I see what you did there. Yes, yes I would describe this. I would describe this as a new era. Yes. Uh, anybody who knows the, you know, the name of my orbiter group is New Era Officials uh, because it's, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's a new, it's a new era. It's a new approach. It's a different way of doing things that we're not used to. And uh, it's been pretty well received. So, yeah. Well, I think that's great with the, with technology as prevalent as it is. And as every game is being recorded, I guess it's just the requal- the quality that's always the question mark. There's really no right. excuse. I mean, we've invested in our state and, in iPads to let our mentors be using technology at field side with officials. There's really no excuse to not go there. So I think that's fantastic. Yep. Um, so high points, low points. Um, I'm going to cover the high point and the low point at the same time, because it's kind of the same. Um, it's really the same event for me. Um, you know, the low point is, you know, nobody wants to have surgery, right? Nobody wants to be off the field for, you know, up to a year. And when, when I, had that telemedicine call with Ben. I call him Ben, but I mean, I should call him Dr. Jackson, but we've been friends a lot of times. So I just refer to him as Ben. Um, I asked him, you know, what the, what it, what it looked like. And he said, well, you know, I don't know until I open the back of your foot up what, what I'm going to have to do. I can, I can guess based on MRIs and x-rays, but uh, if I don't have to disturb your tendon, you should be back in three months. But if I have to, you know, fillet your tendon, down the middle and put it off to the side and take all that bone out and then put it back you're looking at you know a year or more yeah. uh and that's really hard to swallow when uh your life is refereeing soccer right so um that was a big you know a big moment in my career and it's not you know i'm, I'm sitting at home for nine months i'm going to therapy physical therapy every day and i had good days of physical therapy and i had bad days of physical therapy i had days where i'd come home and tell tori that um you know, I wasn't sure if I was ever going to be able to referee in Major League Soccer again, um, just because of, you know, how serious that surgery was. And, and 
how demanding the rehab is and how demanding what we do for a living is right in MLS, you know, and it's not getting any easier. There's more pressure on us every day. There's more, more cameras, there's more, more people watching uh, around the world. Um, so, you know, the job's not getting any easier. So I'm going, you know, I'm going through rehab and I'd say that's the low point. Um, but at the same time, that afforded me, you know, I would never be a FIFA VMO if it wasn't for surgery, I don't think. Um, you know, and so I was put on the, the VMO list by by U.S. Soccer's National Referee Committee. And, um, you know, a few months later, I would get an invitation to the Olympics in which I never dreamed of. Right. And then I go to the Olympics. I do well. I end up being assigned uh, to both gold medal games, men's and women's. Uh, which I don't know if that's ever happened before. Uh, but uh, yeah, so my low point essentially turned into my high point uh, all at the same time. So, Well, I'm sure there's probably referees listening to this that have encountered or will encounter something like that. And that's incredibly encouraging. Just keep pushing. You never know what opportunities will open themselves up. There's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, just keep pushing. You know, it was it was tough. There were the days I would come home and tell Tori that I wasn't sure if I was ever going to get back. And then, you know, you, you grind through it. You find the positives in the good days and even try to find the positives in the bad days. Yeah. And then, you know, you know, Ben's telling me that's going to take 12 months. And, you know, I had surgery in May. I was jogging by August. I was um, running by sometime early October. I was sprinting before Thanksgiving. Um, and then come January, I was able to do some high speed change in direction. Um, so I got on the track on February 6th, um, 2021 and knocked out the fitness test, um, you know, about nine months to the day that I had, that Ben had cut me open. Wow. You know, and I, when I told him, it's like, hey, I, I'm, I'm three months ahead of schedule and, you know, he couldn't believe it. And he actually, when he opened me up, he's like, he, after, uh, we were going back to his house, I stayed at his house when I went up for surgery. He's I got to tell you, I have no idea how you refereed the last five years on that foot. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you know, there's, you know, I got three girls at home uh, and, a, and a beautiful wife. And it's really easy to stay motivated when, you know, what I do for a living is what puts a roof over their head and food on the table. So, yeah, absolutely. it's amazing. what the, It's amazing what the body will do when you, you know, when you when you force it to do it. I mean, I've had some 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 small stuff. I've had a uh, hamstring strain here and there. I've had a calf strain here and there. Uh, I had a grade two ankle sprain one year in, in preseason. Um, I was out running and I stepped on a, uh, it was um, like a plate cover for a water meter and it uh, hadn't been put in properly. So when I stepped on it, it flipped um, and my ankle went with it. Um, yeah. So that put me on the shelf for about a month. Um, but the, the Achilles was the, was the worst one yeah. for sure. Yeah. So one of the questions we love to ask uh, the guest that we have on here is if you go back and tell first year, first month, brand new referee, Chris advice, knowing what you know now, what's, what's one piece of that advice? Uh, I mean, I think the biggest takeaway for me over the course of my career uh, is really just enjoy the ride. Um, you know, we make a lot of friends in soccer, you know, and, referees will find out you know after your first couple of years you start going to you start you know venturing out um you know you get to tournaments out of state you meet people you go to regionals you meet people you know across your entire region so you got 12 or 14 or so states where you're you're meeting people and you make all those friendships um like that's the best part really and and, and like you guys know soccer refereeing is a is a one giant family right um and I, that's that's probably the what I would tell somebody, you know, and it's hard because, you know, how many of our referees do we lose after the first year? It's like 60, 70%. Yeah, uh, yeah. And if I could tell them just to stick with it and, you know, it gets better after you, after you nestle in, just stick with it. The first year is the hardest year. It really is. Um, and stay true to your, stay true to your, yourself and stick with it and find those friendships and keep those friendships. You know, I met my wife through soccer uh, I, some of my best friends, uh, I've met through soccer. So if I could tell, if I went back to 1997 and pulled myself aside, I'd say, you know, stick with it, enjoy the ride and make all the friends you can, because what we do is a lot of fun. Um, and at the same time, it can be really stressful, but if we have all those friendships that we've made over the years, it makes it uh, a lot easier to, 
to stick with. Yeah. 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 Well, let's get to some uh, questions from the audience. These came sure. in various various forms. Um, so we got we got a whole mm-hmm. range of them. A whole range of them. Let's just dive in. So this one comes from Dallin in Iowa. Uh, his his question w- is: When life hits and we only have thirty minutes or less a day to train, what are some good high value training exercises? Dallin, I will tell you that we are working to try to get some people that are professionals in this side of things and nutrition and all that kind of stuff. But Chris, we put it to you. Do you have an yeah. answer, to Dallin's question? Sure. Uh, good question. First of all, Dallin, uh, appreciate you asking it. Um, you know, life does get in the way and life is demanding, especially if you've got, you know, kids and full-time work and it's hard to find that time, um, to squeeze a workout in. And I, I get, I get paid to work out for a living, uh, Monday through Friday. Right. And sometimes it's hard for me to find the time. Um, uh, but, uh, I think if you only have 30 minutes, uh, you know, if you can get some high intensity work in, you know, some, some, 15 second uh, runs on short rest, 10 or 15 seconds rest, which keeps the heart rate up. Uh, you can crush a couple sets of that in under 30 minutes. Um, but I think also at the same time, it doesn't always have to be cardio, right? Um, I think the key to any successful training regimen is making sure you've got a good balance of, of high intensity work, of, uh, of endurance work, of repeat sprinting, you know, acceleration work, and then also strength. Um, they're all important. And I don't think any one of them is any more important than the other. They're all equally important when it comes to, you know, making sure that you're fit for, for what we do. Um, you know, sometimes if you had 30 minutes, sometimes HIT is good. If you only have 30 minutes, maybe it's just a 30 minute run, um, you know, at at your sweet spot. So it depends on, you know, it depends on, and I think this is probably, I think this is another question I saw coming up, you know, the workout schedule depends on, on your game schedule. You know, so if you've got a heavy load one week in games and you're trying to get a 30 minute session in during the week, maybe that 30 minute session is a recovery session. Maybe it's a light lift. Maybe it's just a nice, slow, steady state run. Um, but that would be my advice. So if, if you've got a wide open schedule, but you only have 30 minutes to get a workout in and fatigue is not a problem uh, and you haven't you know, been slammed, been slammed with games. Mm-hmm. Uh, my advice would probably be to get something in, get your heart rate up quickly and keeps your heart rate up. And usually the easiest way to do that is, is uh, quick intervals with low uh, short rest. Mm-hmm. Good. Very good. Well, Dallin has a follow-up question. Sure. Uh, he's, he asks about for those working a lot of games, which is a lot of people, right? <laughs> uh, what shoe choices are good? And uh, and when we don't, I'm sorry, what shoe choices are good when we don't want to wear soccer shoes? Sure. Uh, I mean, well, so I had an Achilles issue for a long time and I could never wear. Uh, so for about five or six years, I really couldn't wear cleats. I could not wear soccer boots. Uh, my Achilles didn't respond really well. And anytime I would, um, my calves and my Achilles would be a mess for anywhere from three to five days. So uh, I found that like a trail shoe, like a running, a trail running shoe mm. was what I was what I wore for a long time in MLS. Um, funny though, ever since I have had surgery, I wear cleats every game now. Yeah. So, you know, I'm back to wearing cleats, but if, you know, I, if I think back to my college days where I refereed 60 college games a season, it was really always, uh, you know, just a black running shoe, you know, whether it was, uh, Addy zero, uh, I think the, I wore a Boston for a while, uh, the, the Eddie Boston, um, or like I said, the trail running shoe. But if you're doing that many games, uh, obviously I would avoid cleats because you're just going to beat up your, your calves and your knees. Yeah. Um, but if you're doing one or two games a week, then I think we should be able to wear soccer shoes. No problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a couple of questions were asking about crazy experiences. I thought this was- insanely crazy red cards it's red cards there's two of them uh, and they were actually cards that i never showed um it was a playoff game in toronto a few years back 2017 maybe um where there was a tunnel bust up at halftime so i'm already in the referee's locker room fourth official comes you know busting down the door uh panting heavily uh all excited uh, there was just a fight in the, in the tunnel between, I think it was out the door and Sasha question, uh, Toronto, Toronto against rebels playoffs, playoff game, almost playoff game. So I go, okay. 
And he goes, they were, they were throwing punches. Okay, well, and they're both sent off. Go back to the locker rooms, tell them they've been sent off because I can't show why I can't show red cards in the locker rooms. Right. So I said, tell them they're both sent off um, and not to return to the field. And he goes, OK, uh, so like that's probably the craziest red cards I've ever given. Uh, but they're red cards I never showed, um, which is, I think, kind of which is kind of funny. But yeah, I've never had I, it's the only time I've ever had a, a tunnel bust up in any of my games. Uh, that resulted in two red cards. So wow, interesting, yeah. craziest in-game experience. It shaped my referee career. It's probably the same game. Um, <clears throat> that game was just insanely wild from start to finish, um, and that was probably the moment in my career where I learned how important it was to maintain composure um and just be calm in the <laughs> really be be calm in the face of what felt like about a category five hurricane mm. um it was just wild it, just the amount of emotion from the players um the amount of intensity from the players on the field off the field from the spectators um every decision was under a microscope um you know i gave I gave some really unpopular decisions in that game. I chalked off a goal for a foul um, that sent people bonkers. I gave uh, Giovinco a yellow card for descent in the run of play. Like I stopped play to issue a yellow card for descent, which nobody, I don't think, ever does that in MLS. Mm -hmm. um, but anybody who knows me knows that I don't really tolerate a whole lot of back talk. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm that game, I had a lot of unpopular decisions that. Uh, I just kept making. Uh, and I, I tell people, and I spent a lot of time instructing, right, whether it's on the collegiate side or USYS at regionals or o ODP or what have you. And one of my favorite um, sayings is referees, uh, the best referees have the courage to make the most unpopular decisions. Um, you know, and like yesterday in, in Nashville, I'm I'm going to the monitor in the 96th minute and I'm going to come out of there giving a penalty and sending off the home team's captain for second caution. Um, and that penalty changes a one nothing game to a one, one tie, you know, when we're, we're three or four weeks from the season ending. Right. Um, so every point matters, every game matters, you know, but that's, that's the nature of what we do for a living. We, you know, we work in high pressure. We have to make unpopular decisions, but um, that game by far is what really solidified how important it was to just be calm and composed when everything else around you is just wildly insane. Yeah. Wow. All right, we're in the home stretch here. Home stretch of the last few questions. So I love this question. What's this comes from Ricky in Kansas, actually. Uh, what's something you're currently working on to improve as a referee? Uh, yeah, uh, good question. Uh, you know, and None of us are perfect, right? And you know, I've been, we talked about this earlier, I've been in MLS for 14 seasons now. I'm one of the more senior officials. I think there's only five of us that have, five or six of us that are active at 200, have on the referee list that have 200 plus games. Um, but we're always, we're still always learning, right? So one of the things uh, that I came into the season wanting to improve on is I call them soft touch points. Uh, I, I, wanna, I wanted to have, you know, so I'm, I used to be in law enforcement, right? And anybody can tell, like, the haircut's still mostly the same. So I've cut my hair ever since, the same way ever since I entered the academy in 2005 or six, whenever it was. Um, so I still kind of have that mantra to me, right? And anybody who uh, has law enforcement experience, um, like, it never really leaves you a lot of that training. You know, like, uh, we go out to eat, and I always sit with my back to the wall so I can see the door. Like really simple little things, right? So I have that I have that kind of aura to me, the prior law enforcement thing. So I came into the season, um, and you know Howard and I um, sat down and talked about it going into the season. He wanted we agreed that I needed to work on finding some more soft touch points. You know, just having casual conversations with players, coming off more approachable, um, and and things like that. So that's what I've been working on. Um, it's a work in progress. It still is. It's still, it, it'll be a work in progress probably for a while. Um, you know, but that's where, that's where it's at. That's what I'm working on. Sure. Very good. All right. Uh, this one 
is one more that's along the uh, training side of things. This is we're referencing the offseason. Tony S. from Kansas asked, what's your workout split regimen for weights cardio in the offseason? So just that offseason training piece. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'll go from a, a couple of previous off-seasons. Our off-seasons are historically really short. Mm -hmm. So the last couple of seasons, we haven't been able to shut it down until, you know, usually sometime around Thanksgiving. Um, and then our mandatory training starts back up January 4th, mm -hmm. either the 3rd or the 4th, somewhere in there. Um, so it's not a big window of time. Um, so the last couple of years we would get, um, we're, we're technically off limits once we get our end of season notice. So we're free to not do anything if that's what we want to do. Um, from the time we get our end of season notice from pro till January 4th, till we start mandatory training again. Um, most of us still stay active. Um, I try to take a couple of weeks and just do nothing. Like I will completely shut it down for a couple of weeks. And then the, the next few weeks before mandatory training starts back up, um, you know, I'll just go out a couple of days a week, uh, and do some light work, nothing crazy. And it's not, you know, it's not five, six days a week. It's two or three days a week tops. And it's, you know, long, long, slow runs. I'll go to the gym and throw a little bit of weight around. Um, this year will be a little different because we have a, a significantly longer off season. So I'm a less essentially shift through the calendar and we finish a year, uh, a month earlier this year. So MLS Cup is November 5th or 6th, whatever that Saturday is, um, which is a month earlier. Usually it was the first weekend in December. So uh, I'll do the same thing. I'll probably shut it down for a couple of weeks. Tori and I are actually going to the Maldives uh, November 7th for our 10-year wedding anniversary, oh. which, is, which is, given our schedules the last couple of years, very well-deserved. Yeah. Um, like we just, we need some time away, uh, as a husband and wife, uh, and we're really excited about it. So, uh, we'll go to the Maldives. Um, we'll probably still get a couple of workouts in, you know, she's obviously a women's world cup candidate for next summer. So she can't shut it off. Like, like I can, mm -hmm. um, you know, and there'll be a little bit of peer pressure there from her, for me to go to the gym with her, which I'll probably end up doing. Um, so, but I'll try to take a little bit of time off coming right out of the, as soon as I get that notice. And then I'll slowly ease back in, um, but but nothing too crazy, you know. Like I don't, the off season is such a short window for us. It doesn't make any sense because we train so hard uh, once January fourth rolls around. Like our preseason training is really demanding. Um, we fitness test usually the first week of February. The season will start the third Saturday in February next year, um, and then it's just you know it's a really it's it's a really dense schedule. There's a lot of games. The season is long. So it doesn't make any sense to not take advantage of the time that we get off, you know, those two months at the end of the year. Um, but I'll still get out. I'll do probably two or three workouts a week after I take a little bit of a break. Um, you know, long, long, slow runs, a little bit, maybe one day a week of lift, one day a week is a long, slow run, and then one day of some interval work. Uh, and then that's that. Like, essentially just, you know, it's working out every other day, really, is what the offseason looks like. So... Kyle, Kyle A from Kansas. I feel like I know a Kyle A from Kansas. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, my favorite donut, and I'm, I'm an old-fashioned guy, right? So, um, you know, I grew up, my family owns a pizza shop. Um, so obviously I'm a natural born carb lover. Um, uh, so, you know, but I always, you know, I judge a donut shop kind of the same way I judge a pizza shop, like the fundamentals. Um, so if I go to a pizza shop, it's just like, just give me a pepperoni pizza and let me try it. Uh, when I go to a donut shop, it's let me try your glazed donut because like, that's the staple of a donut shop, right? So if, if you can't get a glazed donut, right, chances are, you're not going to get the rest of it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, and if a pizza shop can't get a cheese pizza or a pepperoni pizza, right, chances are you can't get the rest of it. Right. Yeah. Um, so my favorite donuts, uh, and some of my coworkers will argue with me because they are, uh, fans of the other donut shop in Portland, uh, Blue Star, but I am a diehard sucker for a glazed donut from Voodoo Donuts. Oh. And then our final question comes from a Tory P from Florida. Uh, the question is who's better, you or your wife? Oh, I feel like I know a Tory P. <laughs> wow. you might was crazy this... what a small what a small world it's... um who is the better referee in the penzo household well uh i mean if you look behind me 
there's more balls and trophies on my side. Than, oh, they, okay. Than there are on her side. <laughs> so I'm just going to let the picture speak for itself. <laughs> Take your screenshot now, folks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, listen, um, we're both a good referees. Um, she's probably a little bit better than I am. Um, you know, uh, she's fitter than I am. I'll tell you that. And I'll, and I'll say that out loud. Um, she's fitter than I am. And which is remarkable, right? Because like, I haven't given birth three children. So, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. I don't know how, she, I don't know how she's done it, but she does it. She grinds. Um, she works her tail off. It's, it's really evident in, in her performances on the field. It's evident, obviously in her fitness, um, you know, and, there's another story there, you know, so we had, um, our firstborn Piper, we had her in 2014 in March. And, uh, when Piper was three months old, three or four months, four months old, um, we were out on Portage Lakes, which is a series of man-made lakes, uh, just outside of Akron, Ohio, where we lived. Um, we were out on the lakes for Tori's birthday in early July and we were playing around on jet skis. Uh, and then, uh, I hit her, um, with my jet ski and um, caused quite a bit of damage. So she had a she had a grade four kidney laceration um, and then two broken ribs, a whole pile of internal bleeding, like to the point where she was really close to getting a, a transfusion. She spent a week in the ICU, um, which from a, a medical insurance point of view was great because we had already had a child that year and met our deductibles. So you know, a week in the ICU actually was steeply discounted because of, you know, so, uh, which caused her to say, well, maybe I should get you back before the year's over now that we've reached all of our deductibles. Um, <laughs> no, so, um, you know, this was, you know, four months after she had had Piper, she had just actually passed her fitness test to go back on the active list as a, as a national referee, uh, in 2000, uh, and whatever, 2014, sorry, uh, in 2014. And so that happened. And then by... I want to say by September, August or September, like two or three months later, uh, she passed her fitness test again. Uh, and it's, just, and it's been the same story, uh, ever since, you know, she, we had, we had Joby in 2016. Um, there's a story there. We had Joby at 7 AM and by, uh, 4 PM that same day, I was going to the airport because I had to go referee the all-star game, uh, in 2016. Oh. Um, our, the, the Penzo's, uh, lives are full of fantastic stories. Uh, and we, we could probably film a handful of episodes of, of Tori and or I just telling stories. But, um, in, you know, after she had Joby, she came back the same and the same when we had Brindley in 2018, you know, it's, it's not like four months later, she's going out and crushing, you know, and, it's, and she passes the men's test, right? She works in MLS. Um, she's passed, you know, she passes the yo-yo test at the men's world cup standard, uh, which like I can't do. Uh, and she's just, she's just a machine. So, um, you know, back to my comment, I'll let you guys judge, you know, who's got more trophies on their side of the of the wall bed here. Um, but there are some areas where she certainly, um, you know, blows me out of the water for sure. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, good. If you haven't learned anything from this podcast, at least you've learned that if you're going to run somebody over with a jet ski, wait till, I mean, make sure that they're about less than six months postpartum. That's ideal. So. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, very good. Well, last last final thing, Chris, we say to everybody is if do you have any final words that you won't be able to sleep tonight unless you say this on the Check Complete podcast? Um, no, I think we've covered a lot, right? Um, yeah. We've covered a lot. Uh, listen, I'm, I love the name of the, of, of the podcast, right? Check Complete, and especially as a guy who uh, does a lot of VA, VAR work. Um, so my, uh, my final words, uh, are the words that I always prefer to hear when I'm refereeing, which is check complete. <laughs>